Good evening, Rowan. It's the 25th of April, 2016, and as you can see, it's five past one, and uh, you can probably see that it's dark and there's a light on, so you'll know it's five past one in the morning, won't you? Um, so, I've got my clock on this video this evening, uh, because I thought that you needed a lesson in telling the time, you see. You've needed a lot of other instructions. Um, like, I've had to teach you how to make Yorkshire puddings, for example, because you haven't got any useful skills um, because you're so busy stabbing people in the back and scheming and conniving um, that you haven't acquired any useful life skills, probably. And obviously your wife makes all the puddings, so... Uh, <laughs> well, not all of them. She's made a couple of them, let's put it that way. Um, and you would have liked other women to make some more for you, and some of them did. But anyway, so I've given you a cookery lesson and then um, I've educated you about Teresa of Avila um, because she got nearly everything wrong about her in that lecture you gave at Dedham Parish Church. And then I've also educated you about St John of the Cross. And then I've also given you education in health and safety and respiratory protective equipment. And I've also educated you about what the Bible says and the correct way to interpret certain texts in it. And I've educated you about Romany history and about Jewish history and about <laughs> the state of Israel and about a lot of things that are going on in the world. And I've also given you lessons in structural engineering and the collapse of the Twin Towers <laughs> and film fakery. So a lot of things I've been educating you in, but now I'm educating you into how to tell the time with an analog clock. Um, because the basic thing about it, I mean, um, it, children don't even have to be taught this really. They see uh, for themselves that the hands go around on a clock um, that's the whole point, you see. The hands go around and then you can tell what time it is um, by looking at the hands. So you'll be able to see now in the time that I've been talking that the hands have been going round on this clock. This is my grandmother's clock, by the way. Um, anyway, but the point is, I learnt to tell the time quite early on, but even before that, I knew that people told the time by looking at clocks and I could see myself that the hands went round and then my mother taught me to tell the time and then after she taught me to tell the time she said she regretted telling me to teach the time to t she regretted teaching me to tell the time uh, because prior to that she'd been able to say it was very very late she'd say oh look it's nine o'clock you've got to go to bed whereas once I could tell the time I could just look at the clock and say no it isn't it's only seven o'clock so she'd been pulling that stunt <laughs> for quite some time and then she taught me how to tell the time and she couldn't do it any longer um, and then I had my own watch by about the age of seven so um, and that was an analog watch as well oh and actually I've got a watch here as well look this is an analog watch so there it is um, you can see it's got the same time on as the clock there um, so I'm very familiar with telling the time with analog clocks and watches and I've been doing it for the vast majority of my life and even before that I knew that the hands went round and that people could tell the time by looking at clocks and watches. So um, I'm not going to explain right now <laughs> why I'm giving you this lesson in telling the time using analog clocks and watches um, but I'm going to go on to play some more clips now which illustrate your skullduggery and your total involvement uh, with the globalist control matrix and your subversive activities. And believe it or not, one of the ways I'm going to demonstrate this is with analogue clocks. Um, so I've put quite a few clips together. Um, to demonstrate the skullduggery that you're involved in, which I've already demonstrated adequately, but you'll just pretend you didn't know anything about it and it was just a coincidence and all that kind of thing. So here's some more evidence, yet more evidence, 
um, that it isn't in fact a coincidence and that you engineer things and that you know perfectly well what's going on and what you're involved in. Um, so I'll leave it there for now. Um, I have put quite a few clips together and uh, I hope you've enjoyed this lesson um, in how analog clocks work and how to tell the time because look I've been talking for five minutes now and the big hand has moved uh, from the five to the from the one sorry to the two so we know uh, that it's um, ten past one now whereas it was five past one earlier so we can tell I've been talking for five minutes and had the hands not moved at all we could have concluded um, that someone had stopped the clock from working either it needed winding up or the battery had been taken out or something like that um, so that's my lesson in telling the time with analog clocks um, so there's just no end to the effort I've gone into to educate you in matters <laughs> in which you're trying to seem oblivious uh, so I hope you're very grateful <laughs> So I'll leave it there for now, but don't forget I shall be turning up to arrest you and I am keeping an eye on your activities uh, so you know not the day nor the hour. Hasta la próxima. Leading up to September 11th, 2001, the date, the numbers 9 and 11, were foreshadowed many times in the media by these people, appearing on clocks, dials, dates on paperwork, and countless other ways. Here we'll look at just some of the analog clocks with the hands either directly or almost directly pointing to 9 and 11, or pointing to 11 minutes past 9, that were purposely shown in movies and on television between 1978 and 2001. At the end, you'll see a clock that will tie the events of 9-11 in with the person who was the main driving force behind what happened on that day. He's also one of the only people on the planet who actually had the means to arrange all the foreshadowing before the crime and the motive to carry it out. And it's not this guy. Superman, released 23 years before the crime in 1978. The clock behind Clark Kent shows the time just before 9-11 a.m. Another clip from Superman, 1978, entirely different day in the movie, clock hands pointing to exactly 11 minutes past 9. Trading Places, 1983, the clock on the wall has its hands pointing at 9 and 11. Twilight Zone, the movie, 1983. The clock with the spinning hands in the opening credits shows 9 and 11 on the dial right before it flies off the screen. Rambo 2, 1985. Clock behind two men in the movie shows 9 and 11. Mannequin from 1987. Clock behind the actors shows 11 minutes past 9. Awakenings from 1990. Clock behind those bars has the hands set closest to 9 and 11. Same movie, Awakenings, different clock. 11 minutes after 9. The Fisher King from 1991. Camera pans up to a clock on the Metropolitan Life Insurance Company Tower in Manhattan. Hands at 9 and 11. The Distinguished Gentleman from 1992. 11 minutes after 9. Same movie, different clock, same time. 11 minutes after 9. The Paper from 1994. Man looks at his watch and the hands are at 9 and 11 on the dial. L.A. Confidential from 1997. Clock on the wall clearly shows 9 and 11. X-Files episode called Max from 1997. Camera shows a watch with the hands closest to 9 and 11. Another X-Files episode entitled Synchrony from the same year. Very clear shot of a clock shows 9 and 11. Godzilla, 1998. Man looks at his watch. Hands are at 9 and 11. The 13th Floor from 1999. Clock on the wall has the minute hand closest to 9 and the hour hand closest to 11. Another X-Files episode called Enemy, hour hand closest to 9 and minute hand closest to 11. Maze, movie from 2000. Camera shows a night table with two clocks. The analog clock clearly shows 11 minutes past 9. Someone Like You, released in 2001. Clock hands pointing to 9 and 11. This next to last clock is in the background of a commercial that played on television the morning of 9-11 at 8.46 a.m., the same moment that the attacks on the towers began. 
It's an Entenmann's advertisement starring Whoopi Goldberg. Notice the time on the clock behind her. Meanwhile, in New York... Here's the last 9-11 clock in this series, and the most important. You're about to see a scan of a Newsweek magazine. The cover picture is of a man sitting in an office window, his watch prominently displayed. When the watch is flipped over to the way that the man would see it when it's on his arm, hands are pointing directly at 9 and 11. The second hand is even positioned exactly at the 11 mark on the dial. Here's a close-up of that watch. What separates this foreshadowing from the rest is the fact that this magazine is from back in April of 1967, less than one year after the construction of the World Trade Center towers began. And the man wearing the watch is the person who made sure they got built. His name? David Rockefeller. Why would he show himself on the cover of a magazine with his watch hands set at 9 and 11 and make sure so many clocks show 9 and 11 in the movies and on television? It's all part of their code and so far they must think we're too dumb to notice. At this point. Well, at the end of this year, I'll have been 10 years in post as Archbishop and just over 20 years as a bishop. So that's part of it, feeling that um, after 10 years, it's proper to pray and reflect and review your options. And also, I think this year, a number of, um, a number of watersheds come up. There are some things that are coming to term, some processes that I've as well, seen through, including, for example, 10 years of running the Christian Muslim seminar, Building Bridges, which has come to an end this year. Um, the legislation in the Church of England about women bishops should be reaching its final stage um, this summer. And I have a meeting of the Anglican Consultative Council in the autumn. So a number of what I call watersheds, which seem to make this a reasonable moment, to, at least to think about moving on. And when a possibility arrived that uh, looked credible and attractive, then it seemed right to think about it. There's also the fact that the next Lambeth Conference is due in 2018. I certainly felt I needed a good five years to get myself ready for the last Lambeth Conference. There had to be a lot of thinking and planning, a lot of consideration about what sort of event it should be. And I'm very eager to let my successor have a good run up to that. Thanks. I'm actually very hopeful that there's, there's plenty of goodwill to make things work in the Synod. Between now and then, there's a huge amount still to do in terms of building relationships, building trust, exploring what options might make the legislation just that tiny bit more acceptable all round. And so I'm determined to carry on with that work. And I do feel quite upbeat about that at present for all the, the difficulties. There's a huge amount of goodwill. Archbishop of Canterbury. It's been an enormous privilege being Archbishop of Canterbury. You're, you're given access to the life of churches worldwide in a, in a really unique way. And it's not just travelling abroad, of course. Every year I make two or three visits to a diocese in England and just spend three or four days going around visiting parishes, schools and so forth. And the privilege is that you're, you're taken into the heart of the local church's life. 
for a few days, you see what really matters to people in parishes and schools and prisons and hospices and so forth. And I think there must be very few jobs where you have quite that, that degree of open doors for you. And of course, I deeply treasure the connection with the Diocese of Canterbury. I reread quite recently, actually, the text of the lecture on Sharia law, and I, st I still stand by the argument of it. It could have been clearer, I'm sure. Um, that, that can always be said of especially things I write. Um, but I noticed that within a few months, um, Lord Phillips, now President of the Supreme Court, <clears throat> was saying something very similar, and at least raising a question which needed discussion. Um, I was a bit taken aback by the violence of the reaction. It became a bit of a feeding frenzy for a few days. But I don't think, I didn't feel any, any lasting damage was done. I feel an important point was raised, a point about how the single law of the land works with and legitimates other kinds of jurisdiction within it, which already happens. Um, the word Sharia is, of course, very emotive for people. Um, and in spite of attempts to explain that it doesn't mean what a judge in Saudi Arabia might think it means, well, people still have that image in their minds. That's why I say I could have been clearer, I'm sure. <laughs> it's impossible to register whether it's been a success or not. I look back on it chiefly as, as a time of enormous pressure, yes, and plenty of invitations to, to all sorts of things, to engage in all sorts of contexts, many, many opportunities, and lots of demands. I think the two things that I look back on with greatest satisfaction are that we've managed in the Church of England to launch this very new mission outreach program, Fresh Expressions, and get the Church of England to recognize the possibility of new styles of congregational life and new styles of training for ministers to go with it. I think that's really begun to build itself into the life of the Church. I think that it's, it's a job of immense demands, and I would hope that my successor has the constitution of an ox and the skin of a rhinoceros, really. But he will, I think, have to look with positive, hopeful eyes on a church which, for all its problems, is still, for so many people, a place to which they resort in times of need and crisis, a place to which they look for inspiration, and I, I think it's the, the Church of England is, is a great treasure. I wish my successor well in the stewardship of it. What are the basic doctrines of this movement? David, I think that's probably the problem is that they really don't have doctrinal standards. They have changed the doctrines of the faith. I sat in an emerging church conference with one of the key speakers, maybe the godfather of the emergent movement, and he redefined what different terms in the Bible said. He, he says the term the world is about us saving the earth. Uh, so John 3.16 is about saving the exactly. earth? Exactly. You could read John 3.16 to say, so God so loved the world He sent the emergent church to save the planet. You'll find the environmental movement uh, really steaming under the surface here inside the emergent church movement. But they have a, a disillusionment of Christian doctrine and really don't want to hang on to it. They, they believe that the doctrines of the faith are, are really immaterial. And that, this is why they join hands with in an ecumenical movement with all kinds of other religions and really have become their own cult. I, I've been saying openly that they really should just admit they're not Christians. What they're doing is not biblical, not Christian 
And of course, uh, they, they don't want to talk about these doctrines. Anytime you, you mention doctrine to them in any kind of a, a debate, whether it's online or through emails or in person, they run for cover. Who is Jesus then to the emergent church? I mean, do they believe that Jesus is the Son of God? Or, I, mean, who is I, I think some of them would, and there are varying degrees of this. But at the same token, Jesus becomes more of just a uh, uh, social justice figure. Yes, so, very much know, so. Yes, people feeding the poor and all, not saving Which is, their souls. And that's part of the deal. Okay. But in uh, in the I mentioned in earlier in the show that uh, I was at an emergent church conference, and this was all about saving the planet, not the lost people. In and fact, they, what was their invitation? Tell about their invitation. Well, <laughs> in in this particular conference, this happened in Nampa, Idaho. Um, uh, at the end of this session, this particular uh, teacher that we're staying away from talking about him by name, but this particular teacher told people to come up and if they'd really understood his message of redefinitions of Christianity, which is what he'd done all evening and had been doing for two days, yeah. he said, take water from the vat that's up here on the table and rebaptize yourself into the new Christianity. New Christianity. The new Christianity. I've never heard of anybody baptizing themselves into the real Christianity. <laughs> But then he said, while you're up here, make sure that you put your hands in the tub of dirt. And these were his words. So they had dirt up there? Uh, they had a farmer's tub that you would feed <laughs> livestock in full of dirt. And he said, put your hands in there to feel what needs to be saved. The earth. Yes. Mm. Now I was Mother there, Earth. <laughs> I was there with another pastor and we had taken notes, copious notes, all through the conference. That's exactly what we both heard him say. I, and no one did it, by the way. No one went up, no but the idea it. was this is what they advocated. Yeah, one of them tried to mold me into a big triangle shape, and I went, no. Just around the time when I first became Archbishop of Canterbury, three things came together, um, you might say providentially. The first was that a um, little group had been working for a few years producing a report on mission-shaped church to be submitted to the Synod of the Church of England, which suggested loosening up the structures a bit, um, making more room for new ventures, new styles of church life. And along with that, of course, came some proposals for changing the laws of the church to help this happen more easily. And that was the second thing, that there was already some legislation proposed for the Synod that just began to move this forward a little bit and allow people to think outside the box. And. When I was nominated, I was asked, um, what, are, what are your big aims as Archbishop of Canterbury? And I said that on the basis of the work I'd done in Wales for a few years, one of my aims was to try and, um, try and make more space and more resource available for new ways of being church, because I'd seen it happening in Wales, and I'd got this idea, which so many people have talked about, you, you see what, um, what God is doing, you join in. How do you get that into the bloodstream of the Church of England? So the two bits of business in the Church of England, and I suppose my own conviction growing out of life in Wales after 10 years, those three came together in 2003. We had a debate in our synod about it, and to my amazement, the synod said, yes, we like this, we'll run with it. And at the same time, I decided, well, what we need is also an independent agency to facilitate this and move it on, not just the church's um, routine agencies, but something specially dedicated to this, focused on this. And so began the process, which ended in the launch uh, about 18 months after that, of what we call Fresh Expressions. Um, the national network, which 
looks to resourcing and informing new styles of church life, attempts to share good practice, to set up workshops for local churches that want to try it. And within, oh, within a year of its being set up first, I think about five or six hundred congregations, new congregations had registered on its website. And that work goes on. It's a, initially a five-year project, coming, coming to an end in a year or so. And um, we're now looking at phase two with some real confidence. So I think I could say the Church of England has, has begun to own this. And I'd hope that at the end of another five years, it would really be part of what people take absolutely for granted as the background. And I've crystallized it from time to time in talking about the need for a mixed economy in the Church of England. Parish churches can do things brilliantly well, and they should be equipped to do that. But they can't do everything. So alongside parishes, you've got to have the other style. They need to learn from each other, they need to be patient with each other, and they need to value each other.